Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who for our sake gave yourself up into the service of your parents, and to teach us true humility, carried by your mother into the temple, and there redeemed with the offerings of the poor, when the righteous Simeon and the prophetess Anna, gladdened by your presence, gave glorious witness concerning you. May the slightest breath of vanity never affect my innermost soul. May all arrogance be ever cast down. May all longing for the praise of men be extinguished. May all wantonness of self-conceit be quenched within me. Give me grace, O Lord, to flee any honour, to hate distinction, and to submit myself with readiness to all men for your sake. Praise, honour, and glory be to you, O Christ, who as a little child did with your tender mother suffer persecution and did not refuse to be carried as an exile fleeing into Egypt. Give me grace amidst the storms of adversity and the blasts of persecution and in misfortune to fly for refuge to you alone, to seek you, to call upon you, Grant that I may receive all things with gladness at your hands, may endure all things in meekness of heart, and may cleave with thanksgiving without wavering to you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you remained behind in the temple, your mother sought for sorrowing, and at length with joy found you sitting in the midst of the doctors, hearing and asking them questions. May you so give and communicate yourself to me, that I may never be separated from you, and never be without the comfort of your blessed friendship. Drive sloth from my heart, dispel any dullness that is displeasing in, my, in your sight. Grant me perfect devotion, and such an ardent thirst after piety, that my soul may be so affected and possessed by it, as never to feel satisfied with worshipping you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, who gave yourself up to live in concealment for thirty years, to be reputed by the Jews the son of Joseph the carpenter, and be subject to the commands of your mother and the same Joseph. May your grace, I beg you, root out and thoroughly pluck up from the innermost recesses of my heart any ambition and seeking of glory that I may become belittled in my own eyes, and may love to be unknown and considered of no account, submitting myself to all, and obeying them for your honour. Praise, honour, and glory be to you, O Christ, who did not refuse to come to the River Jordan, and be baptised there by your servant John. May you thoroughly cleanse me by your merits in this life, that freed from all vices and sins, I may be filled with the love of you and long for my heavenly country. Make me, I beg you, before my soul quits this body, pleasing to you in all things, that, departing from this life, I may be for ever in heaven with you, to see you, to enjoy you, and to praise your holy name for ever and ever. Praise, honour, and glory be to you, O Christ, who for our sake dwelt in the wilderness amongst the wild beasts, and fasted and watched in prayer for forty days and forty nights, permitting yourself to be tempted by the devil, whom you overcame when angels came and ministered to you. Grant me grace to discipline, overcome, and bring into subjection my sinful flesh with its evils affect evil affections. Give me grace to be instant in prayer and all other spiritual exercises, and grant that with your continual help I may completely overcome sins of gluttony and may escape the snares and schemes of the devil. Let no temptations, I beg you, defile me, nor separate me from you, but may they rather purify me and unite and join me with you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who gave himself up to preach repentance, to call to you disciples, and from them choose the twelve apostles to be the especial heralds of the faith, 
gathering together the children of God that were scattered abroad. Draw me after you, and powerfully excite my heart to love you. Do not permit me to neglect the grace with which you called me, but make me ready to despise the world and all perishable things, following you, taking your humility and charity as my example. Give me grace to look for you alone, and with earnest longing to sigh continually after you. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 16. Now when the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He said, When evening comes, you say, It will be fair weather, because the sky is red. And in the morning it will be stormy today, because the sky is red and darkening. You know how to judge correctly the appearance of the sky, but you cannot evaluate the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And then he left them and went away. When the disciples went to the other side, they forgot to take bread. Watch out, Jesus said to them, Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so they began to discuss this amongst themselves, saying, It is because we brought no bread. When Jesus learned of this, he said, You who have such little faith, why do you argue amongst yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Or the seven loaves for the four thousand and how many baskets you took up? How could you not understand that I was not speaking to you about bread? But beware the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he had not told them to be on the guard against the yeast in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. When Jesus came to the area of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They answered, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered him, You are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, my Father in heaven. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will never overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you release on earth will be released in heaven. Then he instructed his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. And from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests and experts in the law, and be killed, and on the third day be raised again. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, because you are, set, you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on those of man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus once again had headed to one of the more remote regions where he had a crucial discussion to have with his disciples. This would be a discussion in two parts, one an establishment of their faith and the other an affirmation of their appointment. First of all, Jesus asked the twelve who people said that they thought he was. Jesus had always referred to himself as the Son of Man up to this point, and the question was carefully poised to open the minds of the followers. The reply was probably unsurprising. Suggestions ranged from the reincarnation of John the Baptist to Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the lesser prophets. The idea that Jesus was John the Baptist is perhaps understandable in part, because it is said that there was a family resemblance. But clearly logic would rule that out, as they had been seen next to each other on the banks of the Jordan. However, it is clear that there was a universal acceptance that whoever he might have been, he was a man of God.
Jesus pushed the disciples a little harder, asking them who they thought he was. Peter, always the impulsive one, appears not to have had any doubt at all. Following on from his partial confession in John 6.68, To whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. He concludes here with, You are the Christ. There being no suggestion of any discord in this passage, we can perhaps infer he was speaking for the group and not just for himself here. But Jesus singled him out for special attention. This brings us to the second part of the discussion, the affirmation of their ministry. Under Peter's leadership, the apostles would go on to spread the gospel throughout the known world, a process that continues today through their descendants in the church. Consider the power that Jesus suggests would be given, which is again reflected in the miracles reported in the Acts of the Apostles. Peter would, of course, go on to be the first of the apostles to be commissioned to preach to both Jew and Gentile. There is one further point to note of supreme importance here. It is a point which is often overlooked, perhaps because it sits a little inconveniently in some people's ministry. Jesus told Peter that his confession was not the result of his belief, but the result of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The reason this is important is it because it's because it can go a long way to explain the differences between different Christians and their belief. Perhaps, if I share with you some experiences from my own life, we can best illustrate these differences. When I was young, I believed in Christ. I had read and considered these things and concluded that there must be some truth in it somewhere. I had been brought up in a Christian family, I had been sent to a Christian school. I'd let us say that by the time I left school, I might consider myself an academic Christian. I had all the knowledge and the theology, but no fire or love in my heart. Much later on in life, after a falling away, I came back to know Jesus personally, and everything changed. Now I have much less time for theology, but look more toward the practical faith to which we are called. In the same way that Peter and the Apostles were led to Jesus by the Spirit, so are a great many of us. I have come to understand that we do not choose to become Christians, but we are led there by the Spirit. So rather than praying for conversions, perhaps we should concentrate on praying for an opening of hearts and minds so that when the Spirit comes a-calling, it is allowed to enter in. Let us pray. O God, who knows us to be set in the midst of so many and great dangers, that, by reason of the frailty of our nature, we cannot always stand upright, grant to us such strength and protection as may support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.